Sorry. I start again. <laughs> Welcome everybody to the uh, Marine uh, Geosciences Seminar. Today we are hosting Professor Elda Miramonte Garcia Very from Maroc, Germany. Okay. Elda Miramonte studied marine geosciences at the University of uh, Vigo in Spain, and she did her PhD in marine geosciences and worked as a postdoctoral fellow at IFREMEL at the Université de Bretagne Occidental in Brest, France. She is since 2019 junior professor in sedimentology at the Faculty of Geosciences, the University of Bremen in Germany, and member of the Marum Center of Marine Environmental Sciences. Her research focuses on uh, understanding the oceanographic and sedimentary processes that control sedimentation and shape the seafloor in deep marine systems. So uh, today, Elda is going to talk about the impact of strong bottom currents on the upper continental slopes. You are all of you uh, welcome to ask questions, of course, to Elda, preferable after the talk, or rather you can write uh, the questions in the, in the chat, in the chat box. So Elda, the podium is yours, and thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for this very nice introduction and for the invitation. It's an honor to open the semester, so I hope you will enjoy the talk. Uh, so let's, let's start. All right, so the, my presentation today is about the impact of a strong bottom currents on upper continental slopes. So why are we interested actually in this topic? Well, the the ocean is uh, getting very busy, so there are more and more uses of uh, the ocean and the ocean floor. Here you have an example of uh, uh, the North Sea and also the Atlantic part where you can see many different activities. So we have in column the background, the shipping density, you have also different boxes uh, that uh, show the licenses for oil exploration, exploration, uh, pipelines, cables, zones of military use, uh, dredging areas, uh, disposal sites. So it's really crowded. And here you see on the other side also some examples for the zone between the UK and the Netherlands with all the cables that are passing by, the pipelines in blue, and also the sites for offshore wind farms and uh, the plant ones in blue. So to really develop all these activities, we need to hazards, but also the oceanographic and meteorological hazards that could have uh, these uh, installations and also what are the implications for the marine ecosystems. So in the coastal area and continental shelf, there are many studies on sediment transport, so how the swell and the currents, so for example, tidal currents that are very strong usually in coastal areas are going to modify sediment transport and how these features are going to interact with infrastructure. Here you have an example of a monopile in the North Sea. So there was a big uh, bark and dune moving in the area. So they did some uh, multi beam bathymetry to analyze how this dune was moving over time and how it interacted with the monopile. So this is very important for the safety of the infrastructure and also what's going to happen with the burial or exposure of cables. And for the engineers, it's very important to know which kind of design they have to use and also for how long the infrastructure will last and for the safety of all these installations. But also there are very important uh, implications for uh, the ecosystems as well. In deep water environments, there is much less known, but the industry has been interested also on the topic of uh, ocean currents and sediment transport uh, in part for uh, the discovery of uh, reservoirs. This, there is a case uh, offshore Mozambique where they found a large gas field in a mixed turbidite contouring system. This is a system in which uh, the turbidity currents are affected by ocean currents flowing near the seafloor and that deflect and remove the fine part of the turbidity current and push it away. And then there is a particular uh, development of an asymmetric uh, channel. 
And yeah, in this type of system, they found uh, gas. And so they are, there is an interesting understanding this interaction, but also uh, for the exploitation, they did some analysis of the bottom currents in the area. And actually they are very strong. So in the upper slope, until the middle slope, there are uh, currents up to 1.4 meters per second. So here you have an example of three moorings from a publication, Fuhrman et al, 2020. And you can see that the currents are actually very variable. So sometimes there is almost nothing. And then sometimes 1.4 meters per second. And this is a bit shallower water, so almost at the edge of the shelf, but also in deeper areas, and more than 1,000, 2,000 meters water depth, there are considerably strong currents. So all these uh, uh, strong currents uh, can create furrows and scours on the seafloor and also difficult drilling activities. So it's, uh, it's really uh, a strong currents in, in this area. But moreover, why it's important also for uh, and to understand apart from the geohazards for uh, marine and installations. It's also very important to understand benthic ecosystems because uh, very often the zones with the strong hydrodynamic processes such as submarine canyons or the contrary systems where we have a strong currents that also control sedimentation, they are very often hotspots of marine biodiversity. Here you have some examples of cold water coral mounds and related fauna that uh, are very often found in areas with uh, strong currents and also with uh, uh, con current related uh, sedimentary deposits. So for now on, it's gonna be even more important to understand such systems because very recently, a couple of days ago, there was a, a new treaty that uh, has been uh, accepted globally. That the idea is that uh, if uh, at least 30% of the ocean by 2020 should be protected. And this uh, uh, treaty uh, tries to uh, understand and assess the impacts of the economic activities on the biodiversity in the high sea, so all the parts that are outside the uh, national waters. And yeah, so all of these will need a, a better understanding of uh, all the oceanographic and sedimentary processes that control the distribution of particular habitats so that we know how to protect them. So our role as marine scientists will be also very important for yeah, the future development and protection of uh, the oceans and the ocean. So let's get a bit more in depth now into the topics. What are actually uh, the oceanographic processes that affect the seafloor. So there is a very wide range of processes in the ocean. We have uh, first uh, the process that act a very long scale and long term, such as the thermohaline circulation that uh, changes over hundreds or thousands of years, depending on changes on climate, and that controls the main general circulation in the oceans. But then we also have uh, processes that affect the ocean floor at a shorter uh, time and spatial scale, such as tides, eddies, or waves. And uh, yeah, this can affect, uh, yeah, uh, have variations over weeks to months or some hours in the case of tides. And we can find them also at any water depth. We have eddies flowing uh, along the the ocean that can affect also the, the seafloor. We can have also all eddies that are only in this near the seafloor and not uh, reach the surface that are related to small topographic changes. We can have internal waves that are being formed, for example, in sea mounts or ridges, and then they are transported and reflected along the across the ocean and affect uh, uh, continental slopes. Yeah, so a very um, huge variety of processes at different scales and um, in time and space. So the questions for us as marine geologists, uh, our main interest to understand what is actually registered 
record because we see that the, we have all these processes that act uh, different scales, uh, but can also affect the same place. Uh, so what are we really registering in the in the sediments? So what is also controlling the seafloor morphology and sedimentology at the geological time scale? And which are the processes that will induce the maximum uh, bottom current speeds and therefore probably will affect strongly uh, the, the seafloor? So that's uh, also what we try to respond. So from all these processes, what are the most important ones and in which areas so that we can better understand what is controlling sedimentation. So let's start first with the uh, general circulation, thermohaline circulation. So what is it? First, uh, this uh, little animation, uh, I want to show you the main uh, currents that we can find on the ocean. So we have uh, this uh, large uh, circulation controlled by difference in density. So we have, for example, in North Atlantic here, the formation of deep waters due to the, uh, yeah, the waters in the surface become cold and also saltier because the salt uh, it doesn't go to the in the ocean and then it sinks because it's denser and it flows uh, near the seafloor uh, along the continent, but also in the middle of the ocean. And during this uh, flow, the, these currents are very often powerful enough to transport uh, the sediment and also to control uh, sedimentation. And now I would like to show you some examples. Uh, here is an example from offshore Argentina near the border between Uruguay and Argentina. Over there, the whole continental slope is characterized by the step morphology. So we have here the shelf, the shelf edge, and you see here is flat, then is uh, steep and eroded. We see truncations in the seismic data. We see now like a little incision, some moat, another flat area, and then becomes a steeper. So these are contourite terraces that are also actually not tectonic, it's just affected as a pure sedimentary processes that are forming this shape. And in this case, this uh, shape is controlled by oceanographic processes. So on the, the colorful part here, uh, corresponds to the currents that are being extracted from a numerical model, also assimilating real data. So these very realistic uh, results. And we see here this the, cur the speed, so we have uh, the red is uh, faster currents and blue is uh, weaker currents. So you he see here a core of a uh, current that is called the Malvinas current that flows northwards along the, along the Argentinian margin. And this core of a faster current fits perfectly with the zone that we see eroded and also where we see the incision, the moat. And then we have more sedimentation in the zone where we have a uh, weaker current. So we also analyze in this area the sediment uh, composition and the grain size of uh, the surface samples. So here you have uh, the location of the different sediment cores and the blue areas correspond to core sediment. And then the, the uh, white ones is finer sediment. So you can see here in these modes, we have the dark blue uh, colors that correspond to the Course sediment, and this corresponds to the zone where we have these incisions, these modes. And we also measured with the ADCP, with the direct current measurements, the velocity when we were there during the cruise. And you see it here in colors that we have faster currents right above the, uh, the mode. So we cannot uh, measure down until, uh, until the seafloor due to limitations in, in the method and there is too noisy the signal in this area, but you can see very well how uh, we have in this uh, mode uh, faster currents. And the same we observe also in other area, this in Bahamas, in between here two carbon platforms, there is also a drift in the, in the middle, so a sediment formed by ocean currents and a mode 
sensation right below where we have the faster current. So you see here are the measurements in plan view from near the seafloor and also in the zone of Argentina. So there where we have the, the mode, the incision, we have the fastest current. And then where we have more deposition, we have a weaker current. So the problem when we study uh, natural systems is that sometimes we don't know very well uh, what was first. Is there here faster currents because there is an incision and the currents uh, kind of focus over there or is the incision there, the mode there because the uh, current is faster over there. So to avoid this and, and to try to understand exactly how this uh, features form uh, over time. We did some experiments in a flume tank. Actually, it's the work of Henriette Wilkins, a PhD student working in my group. And uh, she did these uh, experiments in the University of Utrecht. And what she did is there is a, in the tank a, a slope and a terrace, a bit like in nature. And then this was covered homogeneously by sand. And she let the uh, water in the tank move. And so there was a current here parallel to the slope. And she tried with different speeds. First with a low speed of 11 centimeters per second. There was no more development. The sea floor or the floor remained uh, homogeneous. But when the current increased, then there was a slowly um, drift and a mode to be informed. So we have at the end a very thick uh, accumulation of sediment with this typically mounted morphology and the incision next to it. And also when we increase the slope with the same velocity, there was uh, a faster development of this mode and associated drift. Even also with the weak current, there was a tiny drift uh, being formed. And she also measured uh, the velocity at this location. You can see here uh, the point where it was measured and that, that there was a, in part an across slope component. So this is the, how the velocity was going also towards the side. So if it was zero, it was purely a long slope, but you see that sometimes it's not completely zero, but there is also in part an across slope component. And this is even more visible in this graph where she measured a cross slope of the velocity at different positions over the mode and before the formation of the mode and after the formation of the mode. So here we have the a long slope velocity, so parallel to the slope. You see faster currents on the slope. And the across slope velocity, so we see that at the foot of the slope there is a current flowing offshore and then on the top there is a current flowing back to the to the side of the slope and also we see a little downwelling and upwelling related to so that we have like a circular uh, circulation in this area and this is uh, secondary circulation is enhanced when the motor and the drift form so the this um, a cross slope velocity is confined inside the moat. You see, it doesn't go so much now down here. And we have also this vertical velocity that is more confined inside the moat. So, this uh, uh, secondary velocity is very important for the sediment transport. It helps bringing the sediment to the side and forming this associated drift. So, the summary was that we actually have uh, uh, with a uh, a long slope currents that are strong enough and also relatively steep slopes, we have the formation of uh, such uh, features. So the mode and the separated uh, drift. And the size of these uh, features is related to, this, uh, to the slope, to the angle of the slope, and also to the uh, velocity of the current. But in some areas, the uh, ocean currents are important, but the, we also have uh, some uh, other processes that can strongly control sedimentation. And some of them are the tides, 
and internal webs. So the tides uh, are, of course, very important in coastal areas. We all know how tides can form estuaries, can affect the deltas, and can also form tidal floods and many different environments in coastal areas. And also on the continental shelf, it's widely known that uh, uh, tides can generate very fast uh, currents and can also affect uh, the formation of, for example, large uh, fields of dunes. But in the deep sea, tides can also be very important and we, they affect in many different ways, uh, ways the sedimentation. And we also have internal waves that can form in different areas. So first, uh, I wanted to explain you a little bit uh, how internal waves can interact with the seafloor. Here you have a, a sketch of uh, the a continental margin where we have the continental shelf and the slope. And here the colors represent the stratification of the water column. So typically we have, uh, here you see the profile with the density. So typically we have a mixed layer and a on the near the surface and then a strong change in density. So a peak nocline in the subsurface and then the density yeah, increases slowly with depth. But uh, uh, to in, is the most important part where we have these fast changes in density are in the upper part of the water column and they also affect uh, the upper part of continental slopes and continental shelves. So in these areas, we can first have uh, barotropic currents that are going just to move up and down uh, the, the shelf and the slope. But uh, there are also other uh, features like internal waves that are waves that propagate within the pycnocline, within the ocean, not only in pycnoclines. And uh, yeah, when these waves that are, let's imagine a bit like a surface wave, but instead of being in the surface, they are propagating um, across the ocean. And they propagate them, they form these waves because if something perturbates um, the, the particle of water, let's imagine we have particle of water here, or something pushes it up, then this particle of water is gonna be denser than uh, the surrounding water. So it tends to sink and then it sinks and it's less dense than the surrounding water and then goes up and all generates an oscillatory movement and then these uh, waves uh, propagate in, in the ocean. And then when they reach the, the sea floor, they can break. So here you can see how they can become more asymmetric and finally break uh, on the slope. And when they break, sometimes they form a bolus. So it's kind of a trapped wave that propagates and keeps uh, also some particle sediment water inside and propagates farther uh, towards, the, towards land in this case. Then we can also have the generation of uh, internal waves in near the seafloor. For example, when there is a ridge or a seamount and the tides come here, then this can generate also a wave behind it, like a wave, lee wave, and then propagates farther. And the interaction with the seafloor can be in different ways. Um, so the wave can break or it can be also reflected they can be reflected down or reflected up. So all these different kinds of interactions may form also different types of features in the seafloor. And that's what we are trying to understand, uh, uh, how these different processes are going to affect the, the seafloor and so that we can then interpret also the processes based on the deposits that are left behind. So I'm gonna show you now some examples of areas that uh, have been suggested to be affected by internal waves interacting with the seafloor. Here's an example from offshore Mozambique. Here's the Zambezi Delta and here on the upper slope offshore this area. We found on the water column, so this seismic of the water column, internal waves propagating on the water column. You see here these waves and yeah, the larger ones are in the offshore onshore direction. So it shows that they are moving onshore in this case. And we see here like a mixed area. So it, probably we have more mixing, more turbulence in this area because of uh, 
uh, breaking internal waves. And we also see we have some temperature measurements of the water column. Then the high amplitude reflections correspond to strong changes in temperature. So we are within the pycnocline where the density changes faster. But there are also some mixed layers in between here. You see no change in density. And then again, here a big change in density. So along this pycnocline, we also find waves and boluses, so that is an indication of a breaking internal waves that propagate then near the seafloor farther. So when we have a look at the subsurface, you see already in the seismic here, so wavy reflections. And these uh, wavy reflections actually correspond to a dune field. Here you see it in the multi-beam bathymetry, and these dunes are obliqued to the slope. And, but rather parallel to the slope, indicating that we have mainly a, an across slope current. So they cannot be formed by the general circulation that flows uh, parallel to the slope. Moreover, in the area, we also have uh, some a huge channel, very straight and parallel to the slope. That is in the middle of uh, the upper slope, is not associated to any escarpment or any particular tectonic features. So this is pure sedimentary channel in the middle of the slope. Um, so we were very intrigued about uh, what actually formed this channel. And we see it in the present day seafloor, but we also see a buried one that uh, we know that corresponds to uh, the last uh, high stand during MIS-5. So what uh, we uh, suggested as an idea to spend the formation of this channel is we know there are internal waves uh, flowing towards the slope. So what we think that's probably sometimes when the barotropic currents, so the normal uh, barotropic tide, that means uh, when the tide affects the whole water column, not just as a wave, an internal wave, when it comes on the other direction, we have the waves coming, then this uh, is blocking at a particular location the, the current near the seafloor. So it makes a more erosion in this area, and that's why we think that it's so straight and always uh, in the same location, because we need a brush that will be eroding the seafloor for a long time and always in the same location. So that's uh, a bit the idea, but we are looking also for other areas to try to see if this uh, process is uh, widespread and if we can find it in many different continental margins. So another zone where we found something similar but even larger is offshore Namibia. So in this area, we are there is a ridge, the Wolvis Ridge, and the study area is the upper slope shelf edge of uh, Namibia. And in this area, there is a, a huge escarpment, all longitudinal, with a channel related to it or a moat. And then here are the, all the uh, reflectors that are truncated. So we have a very strong erosion in this area, an escarpment. And then also there is erosion at the foot of the escarpment. This erosion is a bit, is quite rectilinear as well, but a bit more irregular. Uh, you see it very well here in this 3D view of the multi bathymetry. And actually in this uh, zone, the a uh, very large field with cold water coral mount. So all these little dots uh, and high reliefs are cold water coral mounts. And you see that they are oriented, most of them, across slope. So they are mainly uh, in lines across slope. So this indicates also that we have processes that move up and down uh, the particles uh, that feed the corals. So the corals, they need a supply of uh, uh, particles of organic matter uh, so that they can collect them from the water column. So that shows that we have enough uh, movement in this, uh, in this direction. So the, we wanted to investigate a bit more the role of internal waves in this area. And here you see some satellite images where we can perfectly identify trains of internal waves. So although they are in this under the surface, so these are not surface waves, they still modify a little bit the, the relief of the surface water, and that's why they can be observed in uh, satellite images. 
And we also saw them in the parasol data. So this uh, an image of the water column. Here you have the seafloor. And we can see very well this large internal wave propagate and many smaller ones in the water column and then interacting with the seafloor. We see how they break here at the top of the escarpment. And then we also see uh, yeah, some particular reflections and probably resuspension of sediments in the zone of erosion and the toe and also where the cold water pores are. So here you see the location of the channel is here and this is the profile. So we see that most of the waves tend to stop in this area. So probably there is a link in between the formation of this channel and the internal waves. We also have CTD data that indicate that in this uh, zone where we see the sediment in suspension in the uh, parasite profiles, uh, there is a higher turbidity. So probably the internal tides that are interacting with the seafloor are responsible for the formation of this Nephilim layer. So zones with a, a large amount of sediment in suspension. And also they probably trap organic matter and create turbulence that uh, uh, help uh, or helped in the past formation of cold water pores. And there was uh, during some days an installation of a lander here in this area where they could measure the changes in temperature, oxygen, backscatter that shows the turbidity in the water column, fluorescence and current velocity and direction. So we see that these changes are related to so the frequency of changes is the frequency of tides. Now we see that the changes are asymmetric. So that indicates that the waves are already breaking. There is not a regular process and the, the change is much faster. So we have indications that internal waves are strongly controlling the hydrodynamics here. And there is also a link to peaks in resuspension. So uh, offshore uh, island, we also saw um, some indications of uh, activity of internal waves or, or tides. And in this area, the slope also has different steps. So here's the shelf edge, and then you see one step and another one in the upper and middle slope. If we look a bit more in detail, you see that we have a zone with less a terrace, it's flatter, and then a zone with the, a drift, a main uh, sedimentary body. So we did also some investigations of uh, processing the water column in the area and with the parasol that is uh, like a sub-bottom profiler that cannot only uh, measure below the seafloor but also in the water column. We stayed uh, in one of the stations here uh, in the deeper part for one day. And while we were doing other measurements like CTD, uh, pumping water, and so on, uh, we saw uh, strong changes in the water column. So then the question was, uh, we want to understand the dynamics of this sediment transport in the water column. So, but we need to know first, what are we seeing here? Is it sediment? Is it plankton? Is it fish? Is it changes in the density uh, or temperature, the salinity of the water? So he does some uh, work in progress still. So we were doing one day there. And this part here corresponds to the night. So we know that this black uh, thick reflector here that is stable during the day here and then during the night migrates on the top. This is plankton. And this corresponds to the migration of the plankton that goes up at night and then down again during the day. So we know already that this is plankton. Then we also have uh, CTD measurements uh, uh, at this location. And you see in the turbidity, there is a high turbidity near the surface, but then we also have here a zone with higher turbidity that seems to correspond to also this thicker area, uh, darker area that we have at in between yeah, 200, uh, 500 meters water depth. And then we have a zone with the less and the bottom nephilim layer here at the bottom. And this is the temperature gradient. So we have a big change uh, near the subsurface. And then we also have here a um, yeah, song with larger changes that probably corresponds to all these uh, small reflections that we see in this area. So this is important to understand um, the offshore area, but uh, even more interesting for us near the seafloor, 
because uh, there is where we can see the interaction with the seafloor and how it affects the hydrodynamics. So in the area, we actually have a strong interaction between the currents that flow along slope and then the internal waves. So here there are the measurements of uh, the current velocity that we did with the vessel while we were measuring and the seismic as well. You see here the current speed and the direction. So we have a relatively fast currents up to near the seafloor around 40 centimeters per second that move along slope. And then we see some reflections that seem to break. So this look like internal waves that are breaking and they break exactly in the zone where we have the terrace, where we have this step. And we have also this uh, Nephili layer, this zone with uh, more sediment accumulated in the water column that uh, seems to be related to this terrace. And here is a, a simulation to illustrate a bit better uh, what we think that is going on. It's a simulation by uh, Bulgol et al. 2014, where they induce internal wave propagating through the peak nocline, and then when it touches the seafloor, it breaks. And while it breaks, it induces uh, yeah, a strong uh, bed shear stress that uh, makes uh, resuspension and erosion, and part of the particles are then trapped within the peak nocline and form these uh, nephilim lakes. And we have then also the bottom nephilim layer here with higher sediment uh, uh, in suspension. And this is more or less what they saw also on the um, echo sounds of the water column with these high amplitudes. And this is all similar to what we see also in our study. Here. So uh, we were also sometimes uh, doing stations in on the seafloor in on, on the continental slope in this area. Here you can see uh, a station that we did for several hours so between uh, one and seven, so around six hours. So we have the si one cycle of the tide, and we see strong changes in the velocity and in the direction. You see here it was first fast on the top and it was moving in one direction. And then uh, when the tide went down, we had the faster current near the seafloor and then it was moving also in another direction. And we see this pattern also in the uh, parasome data of the water column. So we see the generation of a bottom nephilim layer larger when we have also these larger currents near the seafloor. And previous studies by oceanographers in the area, they showed also with drifters that they, they were Transport was in kind of a zigzag. So we have the main currents flowing towards the north, but because of uh, tides, they go up and down, up and down. So the particles are not only moving along slope, but also up and down along the way. Yeah, so I also wanted to show you some examples from offshore Israel, because uh, actually this is a very active area in terms of oceanographic processes. And there are some recent studies that uh, show also this process and the effect of this on the seafloor uh, very nicely. So there's a very recent paper by Ork Bialik and collaborators, uh, very close to Haifa, where they show that, that there are um, outgrowths of biogenic uh, origin. And then in between, there are zones with uh, accumulation of, of sediment. And these are relatively coarse. Um, of biogenic origin. And then the, the accumulation of this uh, sediment is uh, controlled by currents that flow along slope, but also by waves that interact with the seafloor. And it results in the formation of different uh, bed forms, so different types of dunes and ripples in the area. And a bit farther south of the area, uh, you see here where it is, in between Hadera and Ashkelon. Offshore on the upper continental slope, there are uh, several systems of uh, sediment waves. The, also a publication by Reich et al. in 2018. And they, uh, they show that uh, this, we have two areas of waves, one area that is relatively flat and another area of waves in the whole area. So you see them here in the polygons and you see them how they look like in the multi-beam bathymetry. So it's 
uh, different waves. These are uh, yeah, not the deuces, they are sediment waves, so relatively muddy. And they also had some information of the water column. Here you see the seismic of the water column and the broom by sala frequency that indicates the uh, change in uh, density with depth, the gradient of uh, density. So here we have a faster change in density. And then here the density is relatively small. So we are within a peak north line here. And they observe some internal waves interacting with the seafloor in the zone uh, of the uh, yeah, of the study area. So what the, they found out is that the, the uh, wave of the sediment, the wavelength of the sediment waves seem, seem to me similar to the uh, wavelength of the internal waves. So there is probably a relationship between their formation and also that uh, uh, the zone of uh, the flat area and the inclination of the slope uh, as well as the position of the sediment way seem to be related to uh, the format, to the interaction with the internal waves and also with uh, a long slope currents flowing here uh, along the continental margin. So to summarize, uh, continental slopes are very dynamic uh, environments and there are strong bottom currents in many different areas. These strong bottom currents can be related to different processes that are going to generate also different types of uh, sedimentary features. So we have the main large scale sedimentary bodies, like for example, here we have a drift and the contrary terrace that is mainly controlled by the general circulation. So we, uh, we have the main uh, currents related to the it's a thermohaline circulation that are going to control these large scale deposits. And then we have also other processes that affect a shorter scale, temporal and spatial scale, the seafloor, and that are going to create in some areas channels, local erosions, uh, dunes, particular bed forms, sediment waves. And these uh, very often correspond to internal waves that are going to interact with the seafloor in different ways. Sometimes they can break, they can erode, other times they are reflected in one direction and tend to form uh, sediment waves, for example. And at the end, uh, all of uh, these processes control uh, sediment resuspension. And what is important is not the process isolated themselves, but also in combination. So if we have a combination of internal waves or tidal currents with the general geostrophic currents, then the resulting sediment transport is going to be affected by these combined currents, not necessarily only by each of the process themselves. But because uh, there are still not so many measurements uh, in the ocean floor, especially at uh, deep water environments, we still don't know exactly uh, how these processes occur. So we are starting to have a better understanding, but we need more measurements to really quantify uh, this sediment transport. So that was everything from my side. Thank you very much. And yeah, looking forward to your uh, questions and the discussion. Thank you very much, Elda. It was really, really very interesting talk and especially very important for many of our students that um, that um, that probably will find uh, very appealing for their own research. So I'm opening um, the podium for questions from everybody. Don't be shy, just jump in and, and ask a question. Somebody. Okay, I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I think I should try to open my camera. Sorry, I'm on lab. Just come. Uh, I have uh, this question. I mean, I was just thinking to to ask uh, this uh, sea current that uh, you talk about. Uh, how much influence? I mean, you talked about, of course, it redistributes uh, sediment across the shore and uh, seafloor. But uh, how much influence are we going to say there is on the entire morphology of the seafloor compared to technonism? Because I think to 
to the side of believing that most of these seafloor morphology are influenced mainly by tectonic activities that took place hundreds of millions of years ago? Well, it depends a lot on the area. So if you go to a very tectonically active margin, then of course this uh, effect of the currents is gonna be destroyed by tectonic process, gravity-driven processes. That's why we don't see these larger contour days, for example, so often along the Pacific margin because it's a very active uh, zone. But when you go to passive margins, uh, there you, the tectonic activity is not so strong most of the time. So the deposits formed by the currents are more stable and then we can see them very well uh, in the seafloor. So to preserve them, let's say there is always a fight in between gravity driven process and current control processes. So where you go to a song with uh, <clears throat> a lot of uh, turbidity currents, a lot of mass transport deposits, then you will see less very large contour uh, current related deposit. But even in these areas, very often you see smaller scale uh, deposits. So it depends all on the scale. Uh, of course, the whole continental margin is um, <clears throat> mainly controlling passive margins. So if you go to the whole Atlantic uh, continental margins, most of them are mainly uh, affected and shaped by currents especially the Western part of the Atlantic Ocean. Then if you go to the African margin, it depends a bit more on the location. So if you are offshore a huge delta, then yeah, it's gonna be mainly dominated by gravity driven process, but still uh, there are many areas where uh, the currents are able to shape. So it's all, yeah, a matter of a balance in between the process. Yeah, because I'm looking at some of the, uh seismic data you show in uh, Mozambique and uh, Namibia. And then, of course, uh, my country also have a huge delta that is influenced first by the tectonic and uh, the, the others are influenced of uh, the amount of sediment that are deposited in time. Yeah. So, but from like, because I saw you show seismic data for some location, did you do any estimate of how much, how many meters of this uh, influence we had? Is there anything like that? Like how many tick, the thickness of- Of this deposit, the thickness, yeah. Um, it, it is very variable. So in some places it's relatively thin, but uh, if, uh, for example, if we talk about the Mozambique margin, the same, almost the whole, uh, since, since yeah, the Cretaceous, we have uh, accumulation. But then the depot centers may change depending on the evolution of the currents over time. So sometimes, yeah, the position can be different within the stratigraphy, but in general, we see the effect of bottom currents for, uh, yeah, for a very long time. So definitely, like the the thickness varies too, depending on the influence or the location that uh, the currents are coming from. Exactly. Though I I I have a little subtle question to that. I mean, yeah. before I ask my last question, just to know, in a situation where you, you have, uh, because the, the current can also only transport when you have sediment deposition, which is like, uh, I mean, continuous thing. Sometimes it is annual, sometimes it is seasonal. Like where mm -hmm. you have a flow of flood, you have a lot of sediment coming and you have the current mm -hmm. being able to shift. In instances where there is no, no deposition for a very long time, of course, I'm thinking of that incision you talked about. Is it just as a result of the speed or just because there is no sediment for some time? So there is both because, uh, well, let me share again and I think you will see it better. Um, yeah, you can see already here. So in the case of uh, Mozambique, um, we have, that's why we only have uh, this uh, channel during high stands, because during low stands, the delta is very close by. So we have very high uh, sediment supply. And then even if the currents uh, were probably uh, still there, they were not uh, strong enough to winnow all the sediment that was being brought. 
but during high stands, there is less sediment supply to the area. Mm -hmm. So the currents are able to reshape more uh, the seafloor. Yeah. Yeah. But not everywhere. As you can see, there is a focus on the energy. Yeah, I see gradation from the... Exactly. Right, so area. this part where we have more gradation here, this is the low stand. So we, we have more fine sediments during that time reaching the area. And then during high stand, we have mainly sand on, on here. Then uh, I should just ask the last one so the others can ask questions. Sorry, it's a good topic. I'm interested in it. Yeah, it's uh, great. Uh, this, yeah. Is, this is why I'm uh, asking a lot of questions. The experiment you did in the lab, did you at any point consider the magnitude of the, because you told us about the speed of the current, maybe, 1.5 meter per second. At, is there any point you consider the magnitude to know how much sediment it can carry or particles yeah. it carries? Yeah, yeah, this is a great question. So first, uh, this was the first experiment uh, that uh, we ever did and that we think that someone ever did before. There were, uh, as far as we know, no experiments of uh, this kind of sediment transport. So, what we want to do is start simple uh, so that we can control all the parameters. So we kept the same sediment discharge over time for all the experiments. But the follow up uh, experiments would be, of course, to change sediment discharge and to see um, what's the effect on the transport. So we did also some uh, events with the sediment supply and then reworking. So there were also, uh, I didn't show it here, but there were phases also without the sediment supply, only with reworking. So, and there we see also when there is a, a sedimentation. So there was um, on the side, um, a pipe that was bringing sediment in suspension that would be then carried. So this is not only reworking, we are having also more sediment uh, supply. And we see that uh, if there is sediment coming, then we will have a new drift uh, migrating upslope. If there is no sediment coming, only reworking, then the drift will be eroded and it uh, yeah. migrates, the yeah. mode migrates offshore. Yeah, so this is also depending on, on sediment supply. But we did always with the same amount of sediment. We haven't tried what happens if we change the intensity at the same time, it will be too many <coughs> parameters, but. With more time, maybe in the future, we could play. That. Okay, yeah. I hope someone looks into that. Definitely, mm -hmm. there will be some change if there is more intensity yeah. to that, and uh, the morphology yeah. will change as well. So, thank you. Very good work. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> because others will ask questions now. <laughs> yeah. Hey, thank you very much, Gabriel. Uh, I think Ravital wants to ask. Yeah, I want to have a small question about that specific slide about the flume experiments that you conducted. Mm -hmm. how, how do you scale it up to the natural sizes? Yeah, so in the nature, these type of trees are, of course, um, yeah. hundreds of kilometers uh, or, yeah, very large. So we cannot do them exactly in the same way. Um, that's, and usually these systems are relatively muddy, especially the drift. In the mode, we can have coarser sediments, but the drift is usually mud. Uh, so what we did the, to try to simulate a similar behavior is we used a walnut shell. So the sediment here is a walnut, so crusher walnuts that has a grain size of sand, but because there's uh, density is lighter, it behaves a bit like a silt, a fine mm -hmm. sediments. So we had a, a sediment that was easier to uh, erode because it's uh, lighter, but that could also sink relatively fast because it's large. And with this, we try to simulate what might be going on in, in the nature. And then we did measurements of the uh, size of the drift and the mode. So we have the proportion of the width and depth of the mode, and the proportions are similar to those uh, that we find in uh, nature. So we think that, uh, yeah, that the scaling is uh, fine and that the process are probably similar to uh, what is going on in nature. 
What, what's the size of the flume? So it's 11 meters long, six meters wide, and 1.2 meters deep. Okay, and, and the, 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 is it circular or you just let the-, no, the... It's a, Yeah, I don't have any water yeah. here, I think. Uh, so it's like a rectangle, like a swimming okay. pool. And then we created on one of the sides, the slope, mm -hmm. the rest is uh, deep. And then we put uh, some pumps on the opposite side that would push the, and then we did the corners a bit um, um, rounded so that the current uh, turns better. And then in the zone where we have the slope, we have a parallel current. Yeah. Okay, very interesting. We also perform, performed uh, some uh, uh, flume experiments for understanding how uh, grains are moving, but the grains were foraminifera for shells. Ah, oh, so it was really interesting. I would be happy to send you the. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Because and, also in many areas of contourized, we actually have uh, just foraminifera um, sand. Yeah, so it's yeah. just forums. Yeah, this oh, is the, the, the grains. Uh, okay. After. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. We will need too many forums to do that with this kind of sun. <laughs> but... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah it, it's very tedious work to pick them afterwards. Yeah. And describe everything. Yeah, yeah. So, in which kind of do you do it in a small flume or how do you do uh, it? Well, the flume is also a few meters uh, uh, long and a few meters wide and it's circular. Yeah. So, the, the uh -huh. flow is circular all the time. Yeah. And we use the natural sediment that we collected. Uh, from the continental shelf, and then we uh -huh. run it. We we measured or we described the foraminifera before the transport and after the transport at different velocities. No. And, uh, <laughs> we had like a trap trying to see on which level they are being uh, suspended or, or flowing. And yeah, oh, really interesting. Yeah, I would love yeah. to see this result. Okay, mm -hmm. I will be glad to send it to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, there are no more questions, so I think we can close the for today. And Elda, El, El, I will send you the, um, the the link for the YouTube channel, so you can you know. Okay. Have it yeah, with perfect. You. Well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you, and thank you very much. And I hope to, that you will be able to come, not virtually. <laughs> yeah, I hope so too. <laughs> okay. Have an excellent day you, then. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.